So the next uh, speaker is going to be Benjamin. So Benjamin, uh, so, so we had an actually a nice progression uh, from, from neuroscience to computational neuroscience. And this is going to be more on the machine learning and the uh, neuromorphic engineering end. And already Benjamin actually has been working with some of our neuromorphic colleagues in, in France, uh, like the Damien Cordios in implementing some of these, uh, the, these this exciting work in um, equilibrium propagation, um, also done jointly with uh, Joshua Benjo. Um, and so I'm really looking forward uh, uh, to your talk, uh, uh, Benjamin. Are you able to share? Okay. Hi, Wonderful. yes, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you and even see your pointer. Okay, great. So hello everyone. And uh, so first I would like to say that I'm really honored to give a talk at Telluride. Uh, and so one thing I should mention first is that my background is more in math and deep learning. And it's more recently that I have developed more and more interest in neuromorphic computing. So the approach to neuromorphic computing that I follow is to keep the key mathematical principles of deep learning that are well established and that work well in current AI systems and to turn them analog to get a significant speed up and significant power reduction. So more specifically, my talk is going to be about uh, this algorithm that we, uh, to train neural networks that Joshua Benjo and I invented a couple of years ago and that we have called equilibrium propagation. And I'm going to share with you a recent progress that we have made with collaborators uh, on equilibrium propagation as the goal of building fully analog neural networks, both for inference and for training. So uh, first I would like to thank all my collaborators. So this work started at Mila with my PhD advisor, Joshua Bengio. And more recently, uh, as Emery said, like we've been collaborating with Julie Grolier's group in Paris and uh, also with folks at Rain Neuromorphics. So to better explain what is equilibrium propagation and why, in my view, it's a promising candidate to build fully analog neural networks, I first would like to recall a few things about the backpropagation algorithm that we use in deep learning and what I see as fundamental limitations of backpropagation for fully analog training. So if you want to train a deep network with backpropagation, say on a classification task, uh, what you do is first you present it with an input X, an image here, and then you perform what is called a forward pass. So that is you propagate the signal forward in the network where at each layer you perform this kind of operation. And so you get an output Y hat, which is the prediction from your model, which you then compare to the target Y to compute a loss. And then uh, you perform what is called the backward pass. So in the backward pass, you back propagate uh, error signals, you back propagate another kind of signal, so a gradient signal across the layers of the network. And at each layer, you compute the gradient using that formula. And uh, and then, so you, then you compute the, the weight gradients, you perform the weight updates, and you repeat this procedure over many input target pairs of a data set. And as you probably know, like this training technique uh, works remarkably well across a wide variety of tasks. But in terms of power consumption, this training technique is terribly inefficient when we use GPUs or other kinds of online mine hardware. So, uh, what prevents us from implementing backprop in analog? So you can try and do that, and actually many people try to do that, but you are going to bump into a problem. And in my view, it's a fundamental problem. So we know that we can perform the uh, weight matrix multiplications in the forward pass and the backward pass in the analog domain by using crossbar arrays of memory stars. So this is pretty nice, but the problem comes uh, because of this activation function in the forward pass and the derivative of the activation function here that you need in the backward pass. 
uh, when you try to perform these operations with analog devices, because analog devices are imperfect and non-ideal, you're going to compute these things with limited precision. So there's going to be a mismatch. And that means that at a given layer, the gradient that you compute is incorrect. You get an error in the correct gradient. And the fundamental problem comes from the fact that, that, that as you backpropagate these gradients in the layers, these errors uh, compound and accumulate. And so for remote layers, the gradient gets less and less accurate. So the deeper the network, the worse the mismatch. And for this reason, analog implementations of backprop tend to perform poorly. Can I ask a question? So one uh, point, sorry, if I sure. Okay. So uh, instead of using a sigmoid, what if you use a ReLU, which uh, <clears throat> has a very nice derivative <laughs> and it gets around the, the accuracy problem for uh, estimating the derivative? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about the details, to be honest. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I can't really answer it. So what I can say is that... Also, also one just uh, quickly, this Andreas, uh, quickly, maybe you can answer both. Or a piecewise linear approximation of any function, which is a generalization of the ReLU. But, but still, mismatch will kill you, right? Why? Yes, so there's still a mismatch. That's the thing. Yeah. Why? Well, if the derivative is one, then there's, <laughs> there's no mismatch. It's just a pass through based on the uh, states. Yes. Well, there can still be a mismatch in the, in, if you don't know the slope, right? Anyway, yeah, there's going to be a game I, mismatch. Maybe continue. I, I'm sorry. I, interrupt. That's, I mean, there's always a learning rate. No, 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 you can no, subsume that in the learning a, rate. Yeah. That's a great that's question, true. actually. Yeah. Uh, so one common approach around this problem of mismatch, at least, uh, as you said, like in the, in the sigmoid uh, thing, for, for the sigmoid activation function, one common approach around this problem is to perform, uh, to compute a sigma and sigma prime in the digital domain. But when you do that, so this means that you need analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion. And in doing so, you considerably increase power consumption. So that's, that's not why, where I want to go. I want to avoid this kind of mixed signal analog digital architecture. I want to have a fully analog architecture. And at the same time, I want to be able to compute the weight gradients accurately, uh, even in the presence of imperfect analog devices. And so that's where uh, equilibrium propagation comes in. So, uh, equilibrium propagation, or uh, ECPROP for short, what I call ECPROP, right. is uh, so this is a fairly general method to, trace, to, to, to train a class of neural networks that we call energy-based models. So Joshua Benjo and I introduced this general framework a couple of years ago, but uh, rather than describing ECPROP abstractly in, this, in its general form, I'm going to present it here directly in the case of nonlinear resistive networks. So what I'm going to show you now is joint work with Jack Ross and Kalpana from Rain Neuromorphics. So in the circuit that I consider here, they are like these uh, voltage sources to set the voltages of input nodes, to, uh, to set the voltages out of input nodes, yes. You have like these uh, memory safe devices that play the role of synapses, and you have uh, nonlinear elements like diodes here and there that play the role of uh, nonlinearities. And also, you have these uh, current sources at output nodes that we use to inject the loss gradient signals in the second phase of training, as I'm going to explain to you in a minute. So, the specific construction that we use here to implement the non-linearity non is actually not essential to understanding it prop. So I'm just going to write this thing as a black box uh, component uh, with the symbol sigma. So now here is the procedure to train this circuit with it prop. So first you set the voltages of input nodes to the input values using the voltage sources here, here, and here. 
And at the same time, you set the current sources at output nodes to zero current. Then, so in an instant, the circuit settles to steady state. That is the configuration of node voltages that satisfies Kirchhoff's laws. And in this configuration, the voltages of output nodes here, 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 uh, indicate the prediction from the model. So that's the inference phase inference phase or free phase. And uh, then you compare these output voltages with the target voltages that I denoted Y1, Y2, Y3 here. And you set the current sources at output nodes proportionally to the difference between uh, these two no, uh, node voltages to these two values. Uh, and the constant of proportionality is this factor beta here that I call the nudging factor. So these currents injected at output nodes slightly push the output voltages closer to the target voltages. And because of this perturbation, the circuit settles to a new steady state. So that's the, again, a new configuration of, of node voltages, which again satisfies the, the Kirchhoff's laws in electrical circuits. Sorry, is there a question or? No. Uh, so, uh, Dresden and, have and, a couple of questions about the, um, uh, the problems of going from analog to digital to analog. But I think okay. this, is, you know, this, uh, this is fully analog, right? Well, yeah, I, what I was saying is that at the end of the day, when you go from one layer to another layer, you have to go through some kind of a, when you use your memristive arrays, you're not going to be able, because of impedance mismatch, you have to go to an impedance converter anyway. They are low impedance uh, devices driving, they are not driving high impedance devices, they are driving low impedance devices. So you have to do something, you either have to go to a voltage buffer or an amplifier of some sort, or you have to go to data converter, you're going to send it to a different area. Um, we can talk about it later. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's okay. a I'll, point I'll of implementation. So yeah, let's not bring that in right now. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this uh, later. So I've just described the, the, this free phase that corresponds to inference and this notched phase. And so now the learning rule to adjust the synapses, so that means like the memory stars, is the following. So say I have a memory star of conductance Gij with terminals i and j. And here I denote Vi0 and Vj0, the voltages at the terminals of the memory star in the free phase. And I denote Vi beta and Vj beta, these node voltages in the notched phase. So you see that this uh, learning rule is local. And also we need to store these node voltages at the end of the free phase. So, uh, so that's a constraint that, uh, but we can achieve this in practice with sample and hold amplifiers. Uh, and now the theorem is that uh, in the limit where the nudging factor beta tends to zero, this update rule corresponds exactly to one step of gradient descent with respect to the squared error loss. And we can generalize this to any loss, not just the squared error loss. So if you consider, for example, if you want to optimize the loss corresponding to a cost function C, then all you have to do is in the notch phase to inject uh, currents that are proportional to the partial derivatives of C with respect to, to the output node voltages. Uh, and so now here is one important point that I would like to make and maybe to raise some of the questions that you have asked about uh, this conver analog to digital convergence. And so, so we don't need this here. Uh, in the procedure that I just described, I wrote basically just three equations. 
I wrote the currents to inject in the free phase. I wrote the currents to inject in the notched phase. And I wrote the formula uh, to update the memory stairs. And so um, importantly, I didn't write any formula describing what happens in the middle of the circuit. So it, it works for any kind of circuit, not just the one that I've shown you. So there's no assumption about which each particular device does or is supposed to do. And so what this means is that what ECPROP allows us to do is to say by how much we need to modify the conductances of the memory stairs without ever knowing what each particular device in the middle of the circuit actually does. And so this is very different from the situation with backpropagation. When we implement backprop in analog, we are basically forcing imperfect analog devices to do the operations that we normally do in software. So for example, we use crossbar arrays of memory stairs to do these uh, additions and multiplications. And like we make uh, constructions to compute idealized activation functions. Uh, so we try to implement specific operations. And it's hard to perform these idealized operations in analog precisely because analog devices are imperfect. What ECPROP shows is that we actually don't need these idealized things. We don't need these idealized operations. What ECPROP does is that it takes the devices as they are and it tells you by how much you need to update the memory stairs so that the overall circuit uh, improves on the task that you want to solve. All you care about is the overall circuit. And so the important consequence is that ECPROP is not affected by the imperfections and non-idealities of analog devices devices, unlike backprop. And so I think but, that's... Uh, no, Benjamin, uh, there's a question relating to this, but how is that possible? Because you have that yeah. delta G, you have to somehow uh, change the conductance with that delta G. And how does it yeah. not depend on the uh, uh, asymmetry? Oh, sorry. The, so, uh, uh, ah, okay, okay. The so, nonlinearity yes. and the asymmetry, yes. Uh, of the asymmetry, sorry, the asymmetry. I'm sorry, so, so, the, so in the memory stairs, you know, you have the uh, asymmetry in the, in the. Uh, yes, okay, okay, uh, no, so, sorry, I should, I should, so I should clarify this point here. No, we are not solving this problem here. Uh, what I meant is I, I, I was not talking about the memory stairs. I was talking more about like other devices, like for example, diodes. We don't care if one diode is not the same as the other diode. It doesn't matter for our purpose, but we still have the problems as you, as you just mentioned, like the asymmetry of, um, of weight updates so in memory so, stairs. So we still have these problems, yes. So how do you model the diode? I mean, what is the diode equation? Is it a piecewise linear with uh, a threshold and then a linear function? What is the resistive model of a diode? Yeah, so, so here is the, the whole point is precisely is that it doesn't matter. So you can, you can use any kind of diode and it really doesn't matter uh, what your uh, equation to describe what your diode does is. Is it fair to say that basically you don't see your sigma function in the delta G and that sigma is what you mean by diode? You don't, so you're not dependent on the output of, of this, uh, of the, your neuron, the output function of your neurons. So like to answer these questions, I think you have to dig into the math uh, basically. So it has to do with the fact that you can, um, uh, but, but there, there's, let me just ask that question more simply. So yeah. uh, how is delta G dependent on sigma? So you talked about these, you know, these neurons having uh, oh, yeah, different yeah. activation functions, but then we don't see them in this learning rate, which is, uh, which is fantastic. Okay. But uh, how does that Sorry. happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the kind of the magics of this yeah. algorithm precisely. So what I call sigma here, maybe it was a wrong, I should ha shouldn't have chosen this symbol here because it gives the impression that it's the usual activation function. Here, uh, it's, it's just a, a letter like to, to denote this black box thing. The only thing that you need is, to, is that the steady state of the system satisfy Kirchhoff's laws. But I take this for granted because 
uh, in circuit theory, like uh, any electrical circuit to satisfy Kirchhoff's laws. And that's all I need. So if you look at the, the proof of this theorem in the, in, in the paper that we have recently uh, put on archive, uh, you, th there's no assumption. It works for, uh, apart from the fact that you satisfy Kirchhoff's laws. I'm not sure but going I'm back on. to Andreas' point, uh, you're showing here the sigmoid elements as lines, um, but they're actually devices that need gain, right? So there is, right, it's not just like you have current flowing across the entire network. There must be some buffering elements in between, and then there will be some conversion of between voltage and currents and, and, and gain in a circuit that, that will have mismatch that you need to account for and somehow translate that into the the equation that you had there for the weight of dates, right? And also, Gerd, there would be limits in the power supply. You cannot inject a current and get infinite voltage. So guys, you bring yeah. very good points, but I think for Benjamin, it's, it's right now just a model, uh, creating electrical circuit model of uh, his theorem. And, and you're right, uh, once you go into implementation, physical implementation and all these other questions come up, Right, but I think yes, that's, that, he said that's right correct. That's yeah. correct. Like what I'm describing now is more like the mathematical framework. Um, and yes. then, sure, I totally agree with you that there are still like many problems to be overcome. Uh, and so, but but the the problems to be overcome are related to memory stirs, like uh, this non this asymmetry of weight updates, this kind of things, which anyway you also have in in backpropagation. Yeah, I think it's more than just the memristors. Actually, to um, to design the whole uh, circuit the way you have it, uh, there are a lot of things to think about, like current voltage output. Um, yeah. So, so, but we're not going to go into this here. Yes, right? ab absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, I have a question: Is uh, is does your nonlinearity needs to be compressive or expensive, or do you care? Uh. So oh, yeah. I'm not sure what, okay. Uh, ex I'm not sure what this means. Expensive means like, you know, like um, exponential and compressive oh. means you're going to saturate. So, uh, so you don't care, that's the answer, yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. As long as you satisfy Kirchhoff's laws, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that's it for this part. And, um, so with, uh, Jack Ross and Carpana, we, from Rain Neuromorphics, so they perform simulations with a spice based circuit simulator. So this is the Spectre, uh, simulator. And uh, so here, like there are, the, what I should say is that there are a lot of operations that are performed uh, digitally, of course, like uh, for example, the weight updates. So here they are just updating the weights digitally in software. Uh, so uh, this, this is not realistic because of these memory stores, as you said, but it's a proof of concept at least. And what they show is that, uh, so in these simulations, they train uh, one hidden layer of 100 neurons, uh, a, a network with 100 uh, hidden neurons. And so what we get uh, then is like 3.43 test error rate on MNIST. And so even though it might sound like a not so good performance, uh, one thing to say is that uh, if you do logistic regression, you get 7.27% test error rate. So at least it demonstrates that the nonlinear resistive circuit can really benefit from the nonlinearity offered by the diodes. And the second thing is that, uh, so this network again has only 100 hidden neurons. So it's a very small network by deep learning standards. And the reason why they, we didn't train a larger network is that even for such a small network, uh, training takes 18 hours per epoch. So they stopped the simulations after only 10 epochs, which means already one week of computations. 
Um, so I've I don't know like how much time I still have left. Like the. Um, um, so I mean, we had a lot of questions. I would, I would you know, if you have like ten minutes. <laughs> okay, uh, so ten minutes more. You mean? Or... Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So I've just presented ECPROP in the setting of nonlinear resistive networks, but as I mentioned earlier, it's a more general learning strategy, which is applicable to a larger class of models called energy-based uh, models. And so, well, there are several definitions of what is an energy-based model in the literature, but so here what I mean by that is that uh, this is a system which is described by a state variable S. Um, and the steady state of the system is this equilibrium state, which, uh, which satisfies the stationarity condition, partial E partial S equals zero. And so in the case of nonlinear resistive networks, the state variable is the configuration of node voltages here. And it turns out that there exists an energy function, and that's that's the that's the reason why it works. Is that there's something called the pseudo power of the circuit, or it's also called the co-content in uh, circuit theory. Right, co-content. And yeah, and uh, the and the thing is that this stationarity condition here is just a reformulation of Kirchhoff's current law. Yeah. So that's why it works, and that's why we can apply ECPROP to this kind of circuit. Uh, but now, so uh, what if we want to, so we can also use ECPROP to train uh, models in software, like more conventional, uh, more standard deep learning models. So to do that, it's more convenient to change the notations a bit. And so let's choose, uh, the energy function of the form E of S equal one half of squared norm of S minus phi of S, where phi is some scalar function that we will define later. And so you see that this uh, equilibrium condition now rewrites as a fixed point uh, condition. And provided that the function partial phi partial S is contracting as a function of S, then we can define a sequence of state S1, S2, S3, et cetera, that converges to the fixed point, S star. That's the contraction mapping theorem. And now we can think of these dynamics here as the dynamics of a recurrent network with static input X and with transition function F equal partial phi partial S. So if we choose phi appropriately, then the dynamics uh, is that of a multi-layer recurrent networks with symmetric weights. So a sort of Hopfield networks. Um, and we can train this model with ECPROP on the MNIST classification task, and we get around 2% error rate on the test set. And we can also use the same mathematical formalism to train more advanced models like convolutional networks. So that's what uh, so Maxence Cernou proposed the function phi such that the dynamics is that of a recurrent convolutional network. And if you train this recurrent convolutional network with ECPROP, you get 1% test error rate on MNIST. And in a separate work with uh, Axel Laborieux and Maxence, uh, Axel and Maxence managed to train these recurrent convolutional networks on the CIFAR-10 dataset. So uh, what would it take to scale ECPROP in software to harder tasks and data sets? So one difficulty is that unlike in the case of analog circuits that I showed you earlier, in software it takes a really long time to iterate these recurrent dynamics to reach the equilibrium state. So for example, in the experiments on CIFAR-10, we need 250 iterations. So that's really slow. And the other thing is that uh, one of the novelties in ECPROP compared to BACPROP is that the gradients are estimated rather than computed analytically. And so for this reason, there are several new hyperparameters to choose uh, in ECPROP. 
So uh, in addition to the usual hyperparameters like the, the architecture and the learning rates, you also have these uh, hyperparameters that are specific to ECPROP, like the number of iterations in the free phase, the number of iterations in the notched phase, and the value of this nudging factor beta in the notched phase. And if you choose any of them not appropriately, then learning might just not work at all. So that's why it's a little bit tricky to train with ECPROP. But now I'm going to show you a property that enables us to accelerate hyperparameter search. So in the setting of these recurrent networks, there's actually a property that relates ECPROP to backprop through time. So as we have seen earlier, ECPROP operates in two phases. So first you have this free phase where you run the dynamics for t time steps until you reach the fixed point S star. And then in the not notched phase, starting from the uh, fixed point S star, you run this modified dynamics for k time steps, capital k time steps. And finally, you perform the weight update. But there's also another way to train these recurrent networks, and it's simply to use backprop through time. So to do that, you perform the free phase to compute, you then compute the loss after capital T time steps. And then you propagate the gradients backward in time. Uh, but now the remarkable thing is that there's actually a step-by-step -step equivalence between ECPROP and backprop through time. So in the second phase of training, the temporal variations in ECPROP are step-by-step -step equal to the gradients of backpropagation through time in the limit where beta tends to zero. So here I have illustrated this by representing the corresponding computations in the same color. And to be rigorous, uh, we have strict equality only if we have reached the fixed point S star after capital T minus T time step in the free phase. So so, there's, there's one question actually that I'm also curious about. Uh, how do you know when you reach the equilibrium state? Is this something that you have to guess with the hyperparameter? That's something that you can either, either guess or, uh, I mean, you can monitor this, or, of course, also. I mean, there are several ways to, to, to do that. Yeah, look at uh, how much your state varies when you iterate one more time, and then you, you choose a threshold. or uh, yeah, basically. But actually, precisely like this algorithm enables you to, uh, th that's how we use it, in fact, is to, is to say when we have reached the steady state because uh, to, be, to hold this theorem in the assumption in this theorem is that you have reached the steady state. And if you, if you haven't, then, uh, then this theorem breaks, in fact. So that's how we use it, in fact, to tune the hyperparameters that we need when we do simulations in software. So Maxence did an extensive analysis to show this property numerically. And what you can see here are two of the plots he made corresponding to five randomly selected neurons in the network. And so when you flip the float of backdrops through time, then you can see that the matching is basically perfect, the matching of the curves. And so this theorem is interesting by itself, but as I just said, it's also useful in practice because it can help us accelerate hyperparameter hyper search. And to do that, we can use the following methodology. So first, what you do is that you tune uh, the usual parameters like architecture and learning rates using backdrop through time. Second, you tune the ECPROP hyperparameters so that the gradients of ECPROP and backprop through time match well before training. And only then you train the model with ECPROP uh, using the hyperparameters that you have just selected. So that's it basically for my talk. And so like uh, as a conclusion of this, like at least of, of the first part of my talk, what I would say is that, so the key features of ECPROP is that it preserves the core principles of deep learning. So it can train deep architectures, deep networks, 
via optimization by gradient descent. And the benefits of ECPROP co as compared to BACPROP is that the learning rule is local and you use a single circuit for both inference and training. And most importantly, ECPROP is not affected by the imperfections and non-idealities of analog devices. So it allows you to compute the gradients accurately even in the presence of these uh, imperfections, at least. And, and so here I'm talking specifically like, uh, I'm not talking about the, the weight updates. Uh, I'm talking about like other things like diodes and um, that you use for your non-linearities. Great, so, thank you, Benjamin. This is uh, okay. Um, if you have any questions, yeah. So, so there were a, a number of questions related to uh, the uh, implementation, but also uh, computational ones. Um, so, so one question is: uh, How does this relate to the Boltzmann machine? And, and contrastive divergence, which also has this free phrase in this uh, nudging. Phase. Yes. Uh, so it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is very related in the sense that you have, uh, maybe I can come back to that slide. Uh, so, but, uh, well, they, it's very related in the sense that both are like energy-based models, but in backprop, uh, sorry, in, uh, in um, the Boltzmann machine, like the units are stochastic, zero, one, and, and they are, so they are stochastic and they are, they are binary. Uh, in our case, like the values are real valued, so the, the, the units are real valued. And in the case of Boltzmann machines, like you optimize the um, you do maximum likelihood yeah um, estimation uh, you optimize the the log likelihood the negative of the log likelihood whereas in our case we actually so where is that like here in our case like we can optimize any cost function uh, not just the negative log likelihood if that answers your question. And so what's the, the, cur the, the connection also like with contrastive um, divergence? So in contrastive, so contrastive divergence is specifically meant for restricted Boltzmann machines. So the architecture is like really constrained. Whereas in our case, it works for any kind of architecture, like it works for any kind of, so here in this case, I have this, um, scalar function phi that I call the primitive function because it's the primitive of the of f which is the transition function so it's more general and Boltzmann machines as far as I know like um, so yeah, one way to see it also is that uh, 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 you can use equilibrium propagation to train these non-linear resistive networks, and it's not clear that Boltzmann machines can do that. There's also um, uh, another question that just popped on uh, and, um, the the chat. So, I guess it's it's also related to how how does this relate to gradient-based learning? I mean, how is it that you cannot do those um, you know vector Jacobian products and still get a a signal uh, for learning. Uh, I know this yes. is, uh, all that you explained, but, uh, uh, and it looks great but, when you present it, but I, this is also something that it's I-, hard, I, I okay, It's hard to believe, but I, I, what I could tell you is precisely just now you were talking about Boltzmann machine learning. Mm -hmm. And in the Boltzmann, the general Boltzmann machine learning algorithm, when you compute the gradients, you also don't have like these uh, Jacobians, right? you have, you sample, you get a sample in the positive phase, you get a sample in the negative phase, and then you have like in both phases, you have a Hebian update or anti-Hebian update. And you don't have Jacobians in that case. So here it's a bit, it's kind of, it's kind of the same, yeah. Um, the, the answer to this question is hidden in the math. <laughs> and, and just to be, um, uh... So uh, not not picky, but the uh, precision here is that the the time, the dynamics. When you talk about the 250 iterations or the time in backprop through time, this is not time in the data. This is time internally in the 
kind of dynamics of your network. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. So because here, like when I talk about backprop through time, it's sometimes a little bit confusing because actually the recurrent networks that we are con considering here do not deal with uh, time varying data. It deals with static data. And so it's this recurrence that you need to reach the steady state, but you at each step of uh, the dynamics, you feed in the same uh, the same input. Yeah. So it's internal, as you say. Yes. Yeah. And your weights are symmetric, right? Correct. The weights are symmetric here. Yes. So then in I think the case, there are much closer connections between Boston machines or Hopfield networks and, and, and this scheme, right? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Like it's uh, very closely related. It's more, I would say, equilibrium propagation is more general. And it, so it's, it's also different because there are these differences as we. So it's called the wake uh, sleep algorithm, right? That's what Jeff Hinton called it, right? So that's that's a bit different. Like the wake sleep algorithm has, uh, you don't need this assumption of um, symmetric weights in the wake sleep algorithm. So it's a bit different. Uh, yeah. In the original boss machine, yes, there's there's definitely a symmetric weights. Absolutely, absolutely. So it's it's close to Boltzmann machines, but as I said, the Boltzmann machines are binary and stochastic, and not here. Yeah. Okay, um, so in the, in the interest of time, um, so again, you know, we're going to, we have an informal discussion session after, um, after the uh, tutorial questions and answers that Terry will be giving, so, um, and I'll certainly be around a bunch of miles to have a couple of more questions. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Sure. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, so uh, this concludes the three talks we had this morning. So additionally, what we have now is a uh, question and answer session for uh, Terry's uh, tutorial. Okay, Emre, uh, can uh, you uh, start the recording? Yes, thank you. Yeah.